Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, coming to you from Le Salon du Bourget, the Paris Air Show. Coming up, the news, the deals, the big players, the aviation industry as it comes to France for its biennial visit. And on the defense side of things, France is also home to Dassault Aviation. We profile the country's leading fighter jet, the Rafale. So bonjour from Paris everyone, welcome to this special edition of Counting the Cost, focusing entirely on aviation as we are here at the world's oldest air show, the 51st edition of Le Salon du Bourget, the Paris Air Show. Now bear in mind, in 2015 we are in a year of two major air shows, this one here in Paris, and then in about five months time we'll be in Dubai for the air show there. So as such we've seen orders here at Paris on the smaller scale and for the smaller jets. Perhaps later in the year in Dubai, we'll be seeing more of the orders, the large scale orders for the larger wide body planes. Over the course of the show, we'll hear from some of the major players. We'll also talk defense, the Rafale fighter jet, which is made here in France and has seen so much success. We'll profile that. But first of all, we took a walk around the air show, had a look at some of the planes on offer and found out about who'd been buying them. So we start with Airbus's A380 Super Jumbo Jet. It's the behemoth of the skies, always a huge draw card at these air shows but by the end of the first day no one had bought one that in itself is not a huge surprise when you consider an airline like emirates from dubai has 140 on order this plane is more about the backlog of orders the problem is going forward there are questions over its fuel efficiency are the engines good enough and until a new one is brought out there is some uncertainty over the a380 program this is Boeing's 787 Dreamliner, a plane already proven in the fuel efficiency stakes. Now, Garuda Airline from Indonesia announced it wants to buy 30 of these planes, but it only announced an intent to buy them, which tells you something about the uncertainty that does still exist in the industry. This year, we expect to deliver somewhere between 750, 755 aircraft. Should be a record for us, and clearly, it will outpace our competition. This is Airbus's A320, a narrow body, single aisle plane. Now, it's got a new cousin on the way, if you like, the A320neo, and General Electric Capital Aviation, that is the leasing arm of General Electric, has decided to buy 60 of them. It's also got, you might call an older brother, the A330, which is getting a revamp, the A330 Regional. Saudi Arabian Airlines has ordered 20 of those. Now we're really getting back to those routes with the 330 because we've seen a big market potential market in places where the infrastructure and there's big growth and the infrastructure maybe isn't quite keeping up in terms of both in the air and on the ground. And one of the ways of solving these problems to satisfy the demand for travel is to go for a bigger aircraft and that's what the 330 offers. At the same relative seat costs and things like that of the single aisle aircraft such as the 320. Boeing's 777 is an absolute long haul workhorse. You can fly 17 hours non-stop in one of them. Now behind me is a China Airlines plane. Qatar Airways has got a lot of them already, but it's decided here at Paris it wants more. Ten more. Boeing 777-8X, that is the new version of the 777, to add to the 50 777-X is already on order, plus another four 777 freighters. You've got solid orders worth $4.8 billion. Well, I'm joined now by Marianne Simpson, who's the deputy publisher at Runway Girl Network and collective of online uh, airline journalists. I guess what you do is you look at the where the airlines are taking their aeroplanes. Because, yes, there have been tons of orders here at Paris, but it's up to an airline what it actually wants to do with those orders and, and customise its plane for its, uh, for its customers. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the airlines have a little bit more money these days, you know, following bounce back from the recession and the fact that the fuel, fuel prices have come down a little bit. So they're looking at ways to sort of maximize passenger count on board, obviously, to sell as many tickets as possible, but at the same time, create a differentiated experience that helps them stand out from their competitors in the region. And it's an increasingly competitive industry, so it's absolutely necessary. And it's time sensitive as well. You order a bunch of planes, you want them in the skies as quick as possible, as you say, to start moving those people around. But again, against the clock, how are airlines doing this? Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, Airbus and Boeing are both putting out between seven and 900 aircraft a year, and their order backlogs, I think, are like in the thousands. 
So uh, what Airbus is doing specifically with the A350 XWB, which is their uh, newest long-range aircraft, mm -hmm. is that they're starting to take a catalog approach. So they are sort of uh, collecting a, a, a catalog, it's mm -hmm. not really a book, but we'll call it a catalog, sure. of suppliers and products that they are going to recommend that their customers use in the cabin. But, uh, you know, again... So, so I could walk in, oh, if I bought a new plane and say, right, I want that in economy, I want that in business, get me that plane on the move. Yeah, so they've got different um, color schemes or different themes that you can go with and then a selection of products. So you can say, I want, uh, you know, this this product of seat, I want this uh, in-flight entertainment solution, I want this connectivity solution, but I want this color theme because, mm. you know, we're a holiday carrier and we want bright colors. Or right. we're a very serious legacy carrier and we want a more subdued color palette. And Airbus has a customer definition center in Hamburg, Germany, actually, where they invite the airlines to come in and spend, you know, a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one time with them and, and visualize and design those based on the catalog as much as they can because that expedites the fitting out of the cabins and it helps keep everything on track. How much do you think the customer cares about all of this? Part of me just thinks when someone books a flight they want to get the cheapest ticket so that they can get to where they want for the, for the least amount of price. Are they worried that much about what food they're going to get, what screen they're going to get, all these sorts of things? Well, it depends on the business model of the airline, really. Uh, there's a lot of different passenger profiles and I think it's an airline's job to determine who is their customer. Are they a leisure airline? Are they a business airline? Are they a low-cost airline? Are they trying to provide a combination? Uh, so it's up to them to define who their who their customer d demographic is, mm. and then I think sort of try to cater to that as best they can. Mm. And with the uh, the industries and the demands of the passengers changing so quickly, they need to really think forward when they're doing that, and uh, it can be tricky. Being in Paris, of course, means being in Europe. And when you talk about European aviation, Airbus is the first name which really springs to mind. It's based in Toulouse, a lot further south from here in Paris. But you'll remember we were there at the end of last year for the launch of the new A350 plane. Well, Airbus came up with quite an astonishing number here at the air show, 32,000 600. That is the number of new planes that Airbus is forecasting will be ordered up until the year 2034. So we're talking upwards of 30,000 planes, new planes, in the next 20 years. It sounds like a lot, but can you sort of break down the number a bit for me and explain to our viewers what that sort of demand really reflects? Okay, so that is the total demand uh, on one hand for replacement aeroplanes as they get retired from the world fleet. Uh, but in large part, these are additional, these are incremental aeroplanes in a marketplace that continues to grow at an amazing rate. At what, what sort of sizes though? Because I've noticed the orders at this show have been for smaller planes, basically. We've got a great big A380 behind us with no orders, which in itself is not surprising. There are, there's a lot of backlog, but where do you see the growth in the types of planes? Okay, of the 32,600, about 22,900 are single aisle aeroplanes. So in Airbus parlance, those are A320 family aeroplanes. That's 70% of the total. Uh, but the wide body total is worth 55% of the 4.9 trillion US dollars that the market is worth. Are you worried at all about the current levels of growth? I already mentioned that there is backlog, you've got plenty of orders, but orders for this plane, the A380, have definitely dried up. No, we have a good backlog for all models. Clearly we have a bigger backlog for the single aisle aeroplanes, uh, but as a reminder, we're producing 42 of those every month. That is going up to 50 a month in two years' time. Uh, the 380 behind us doesn't have quite the same prodigious production rates, and therefore the backlog is a bit smaller. Uh, but I don't think there's any cause to be concerned. Is the 380 safe? Because there was a bit of talk and a bit of confusion, not safe as in uh, up in the sky, but the program, I should point out. There okay. was some talk about, uh, well, some of the airlines are saying the, the engines aren't fuel efficient enough. There was one of your executives saying we have to look at the future of the program. What is the future of the program? Well, just to be clear, safety is the priority for everybody in this industry. But in terms of the longevity of the program, uh, then yes, clearly our senior management have been talking about sometime in the future there being perhaps a stretched aeroplane with higher capacity, perhaps an aeroplane with newer generation engines. But in the immediate, uh, what is occupying our attention right now is finding ways and means of uh, arranging the cabins, if you will, uh, changing the cabin configuration to suit what we see the market wanting us to do or our customers to do. And for example, we see there being a need for a four-class aeroplane, not just the traditional first-class, business class and economy, but a premium economy class in there as well. Uh, and the aeroplane is particularly well adapted to that, and we can see that aeroplane having something in the order of 544 seats, which is rather more than the capacity that most of our operators are flying today. The other thing is, though, this plane's only as good as the airports it can fly to, isn't it? You know, 
Doha Airport, for example, has finally been upgraded and can now take these. Dubai can, obviously. But you sort of, to sell these planes, you've got to rely on airports and infrastructure keeping up with you. Is that not right? Well, I think the infrastructure really is keeping up with us. If you look at today, there are almost uh, 100 different uh, city pairs being flown by this aeroplane, something like 50 different airports. And every week or every month, you read of another airport investing uh, to allow the 380, not just to operate, because it can operate many other places, but to operate as efficiently as it's built to do. And that is primarily, for example, dual-level uh, jetways, so that both decks can be loaded and unboarded at the same time. Tell me about your 350 and the numbers involved in that, the number of orders and the dollars involved, because if I can say the B word here, Boeing, they got the jump on you with the Dreamliner and they have about a thousand plane backlog, I think it is, for their car carbon composite plane. How is yours catching up? Okay, so the airplane that's uh, behind me is our fourth delivered 350-900. So we only have, uh, by dint of uh, uh, fortune, we only have 777 left to deliver of the announced order book. They were quite confident this airplane will be a good seller, will be a best seller. Uh, yes, Boeing got the jump on us, as you put it, with the 787 coming out a little bit earlier. Uh, but our production rate is ramping up uh, aggressively. We'll get to rate 10 in about three years' time. Uh, and yes, we will give them a good run for the money. Just to give us an idea, or our viewers' idea, because you and I are talking very confidently about aeroplanes, we know them. Uh, tell our viewers, for example, we've got a 380 and a 350 behind us. Mm -hmm. What does one of those cost? And how long does it take for Airbus to make one of them and get it to its customers? All right, perhaps the most exciting headline number is that of the 380. So one of those, were you to have your checkbook ready, would be a 428 million US dollars. And how long does it take to build? Oh, I think from the moment we would get an order to delivering the airplane, it would be somewhere in excess of two years. But it depends at what point in time you really start, from the very tiniest parts to when we finally assemble the airplane. Yeah, so. And the 350? 350, uh, because there are several models there, the prices vary, but they're somewhere in the 300 millions. And again, if you wanted to buy an airplane, well, first of all, we have a very full order book. Uh, but talking of an aeroplane that we're going to start today in final assembly, that aeroplane will be delivered in a few months. So I guess, finally, those numbers underline, highlight, how important the aviation industry is to the global economy. If that great big thing behind you costs half a billion dollars to make and you order however many of them, mm -hmm. this is a huge amount of turnaround and, and jobs and, and all these sorts of things which can help a global economy which is still struggling. It is. Now, aviation is one of the, the motors of the industry, if you will. Now, there are something like 58 million people employed worldwide in the aviation industry, directly or indirectly. Uh, you can see very clearly if something like a volcano eruption disrupts air travel, just how that impacts the world economy very briefly before normal service is restored. Uh, and air travel, dare I say, has become something of a commodity. It's no longer a luxury. It's something that people can afford to do, and it's something that people want to do. Airbus's traditional rival is, of course, Boeing, the American aeroplane maker. But there is another transatlantic rivalry going on, and it's a little further up, actually, in orbit. Commercial space flight is becoming increasingly competitive, and it seems these days there are two major players, SpaceX from the United States, and here, as we found out, the European Space Agency and its Ariane program. The money that goes in, what do you get back? We see these wonderful pictures, we see probes landing on comets. What do you get back from that for the, I'm sure, large amounts of money that are put in? Well, you should not forget that there is a big commercial market in space. I mean, at this moment inside, people are talking about telecom satellites. Telecom satellites is pure business. It's a big business. And space is enabling that business, enabling by building the satellites, but also enabling by launching them by, uh, by launches like uh, the Ariane family in Europe. So there is a big business. If you look at science, of course, the first interest of science is not so much the business, but is curiosity, understand things, uh, detect things. But at the same time, there's a spin-off also from science, because the, the technology, the materials, the things that you are developing for science, later on are also used in commercial applications. You mentioned Ariane, so let's talk about that. Tell us about the success of that program and I guess how it competes with um, SpaceX in the United States, which is the, probably the most well-known uh, commercial endeavor over there. 
Yes, well, the, the, the interesting situation at the moment is that there are two very successful commercial launch service operators. One is Ariane Spas and the other one is SpaceX. Mm. And this is sort of a duopoly that you see at the moment mm. in, the, in the international market. Ariane has a fantastic track record. Track record. Ariane 5 has already 63 launches without any uh, problem. So it's really a very reliable uh, business and it has uh, more than 50% of the world market, uh, the world market, the commercial world market. So in that sense, it's, it's a very, a very uh, successful launcher. But of course, we are looking ahead, we're looking into the future, and we know that uh, to be also competitive in the future, we have to reduce the cost. And that's why we are developing a new launcher for 2020, which we call Ariane 6. Can you give me some numbers on cost, just for our viewers to understand and I know I'm being very broad here, but how much money it costs to launch, how much money it costs to, any sort of figures like that, just to give us a real idea of what's being spent. It's, it is a very difficult question, <laughs> <laughs> because the one thing is cost, and the other thing is what people are paying for. Uh, right. cost. We know that in some parts of the world, if you look at uh, what we call institutional launches, launches from agency, that there are higher prices than in the, on the commercial market. For Ariane uh, 5, uh, we have not that situation. So you, you sell in the market a, a launcher for, uh, for commercial uh, application, for commercial satellites, and we can launch two satellites in one go with Ariane 5. And in the order of magnitude, we are talking about 150, 140, 160, these type of uh, millions of, uh, of uh, euros or dollars for a launch service. Now, if there is a problem with a launcher, of course, the costs are uh, increasing and uh, you have to find ways to, uh, to support such a, such a company, which happens everywhere. If you look at the development of a launcher, it's a totally different story. The development of a launcher is largely paid by governments everywhere in the world. If we look at Ariane 6, we are talking about a 2.5 billion uh, development cost for a new Ariane 6 launcher to be developed in the next five years. Tell me about investments. Do you have trouble these days attracting investment given there's been problems in Europe for quite many years now? People are being a bit more careful with their dollars and their euros. How do you attract investors into this business? If I take the example again of the launcher, uh, we took a decision last year, end of last year, which we take in, uh, by our ministers in Europe that are responsible for space. So they invest in the development of a new launcher. And yes, it was not easy because uh, the financial situation in, uh, in our economy is not fantastic. It's difficult to increase uh, expenditures in the public sector. All that was true. At the same time, they have taken a decision because they believe that we need independent access to space. They believe that we need to have a launcher to launch our institutional satellites, but also to play a role in a commercial market. So despite all the difficulties, they were ready to put an awful lot of money on the table. I must say, sometimes I'm myself, I'm surprised that we were successful, but we got the money. Just finally, while we're here, we've got this wonderful rocket here. Can you tell me a little bit about it and where it's been? It's, it's a you know, great landmark here in Le Bourget. Yes, it's a one-to-one -one model, by the way. It has the real size of uh, the Ariane 5 launcher. So the, it's the Ariane 5. Mm. And you see the main stage uh, with the, the Falcon engine at the, at the bottom. The upper stage, which brings to where the satellite is uh, hosted, so to say, has another engine, of course, the Vinci engine. And on the side, you see the two big boosters of the Ariane 5. The boosters are solid propulsion, while the uh, Vulcan and uh, Vinci engine are cryogenic uh, engines. So, so this beast is able to bring 10,000 kilos into GTO orbit, which means mainly is mainly for the commercial telecom market to bring these type of satellites uh, in the, in the, the, the designed orbit for uh, telecom uh, applications. There's another side to things here at an air show like Le Salon de Bourget, and that is the defence side of things. It's a little bit more low-key, even though you can walk past any number of fighter jets, unmanned drones, even missile systems. The deals which are done are a little bit more low-key. They don't get the big announcements like the likes of Boeing and Airbus do. Now, here in France, Dassault Aviation is a big name. It's the name behind the Rafale fighter jet, which has been seen in action recently in places like Libya, Afghanistan, and Mali. And it's those combat missions which have seen its profile rise and more orders come in, particularly from places like the Middle East. We took a closer look at the Rafale fighter jet. The Rafale is a French fighter jet. It is used predominantly by the French Air Force. 
but up until recently, no one else wanted it. Performance-wise, it just didn't stack up against competitors like the Eurofighter or the F-18, even if the boss of the company which makes it thinks otherwise. The Rafale is a perfect aircraft to be able to uh, match the requirement, uh, whatever it is, air-to-air, uh, air-to-surface, uh, rake emission, and uh, I think that this capability to be omnivorous is really what has been recognized <coughs> by our customers. So I think by operation uh, in uh, some countries, they have shown what are the capabilities of Rafale. Mm -hmm. As you said, the uh, problems in some areas in the world has also uh, pushed some uh, government uh, to buy and to reinforce their own uh, defense. And this is the key, not so much to Rafale's in-the-air success, but its export success. The war in Libya in 2011 was a key moment when Middle Eastern countries saw what the plane could do in combat and that they could buy them with much more flexibility. Basically, this is the same aircraft. This is based on the French definition. And if there are some customers uh, wanting to have uh, uh, options, uh, dedicated functions, uh, we are ready to, to develop. Then we propose uh, in their contract to develop their specificities. Obviously, we need uh, permission, we need authorization from our French uh, authorities to, to sell to these countries or to upgrade to these countries. And uh, normally, uh, these all customer countries are uh, good uh, partners of France and uh, these relationships are strategic relationships. The sheer number of people who come to see the Rafale at an air show like this is testament to the amount of interest in it. Now, Dassault Aviation spent $45 billion just on developing the Rafale, but that has been money well spent when you consider that Qatar has bought 24 of them, Egypt's bought another 24 of them, India has bought 36 of them, and there is talk of a fourth major deal in the pipeline as well. Well, it struggled in the beginning, but a lot of these fighter programs do. Um, however, it struggled to gain its first export customer. I mean, for years it languished uh, just a French, French Air Force and French Navy program. So basically, this year has been extremely good for the airplane because Egypt has ordered 24 and the India has also placed an order for 36. Now, the Indian procurement has been running for some time, and I think France would certainly like to sell more aircraft there. But while the number of new Rafales in the sky is known, just what they're costing those countries is a little less obvious. We could say probably a modern fighter like this could cost, we see, 80 to 120 million dollars. But it's very difficult to say because it's, the negotiations are very secretive. In addition, when people buy the plane, um, basically Dassault will have to invest some of that money back into the um, host government. For example, in the case of India, they'll have to put 30 percent of the contract value back into India. Okay, because, you know, these governments, if they spend all this money, they're going to want to receive something in return, not just the aircraft. So no doubt Rafale has become a popular plane, and Assault's view is that what's good in the sky is good on the ground for the French and European economies. I think that really aeronautics in France uh, are really good with the civilian side, uh, this is uh, true with uh, Airbus, for example, but also true with uh, Dassault with Falcon or with uh, Safran for the engines or Thales with the avionics. And the military side, which also involved uh, Dassault, Thales, Safran, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, complementary. So that is it for our special edition of Counting the Cost from here at the Paris Air Show. If you've got any thoughts you'd like to send us on this show or any future shows, uh, you can do that on Twitter by tweeting either me, at Kamal AJE, or our business editor, at Abid Oliver Ali, and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you're tweeting us, or just drop us an old-fashioned email, countingthecost at aljazeera.net. That's it from the Paris Air Show. We're going to leave you now with some images of the wonderful aerial displays we saw this week in the skies above Paris.